In both testaments, we see God as a bridegroom, relate to his people, whom he calls his bride. He has bestowed us to himself, surrounds us with unconditional love and mercy, and woos us into a place of intimacy. Ministry and intercession must be birthed out of this understanding of a bridegroom God and his passionate heart for his bride. We see all we do as a way to prepare a bride and to present her spotless to the bridegroom God. All right, let's take a moment to pray, then we'll get into God's word together. Just um, let's just bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this time to worship you, to honor you. And this morning, Lord, as we open up your word, we ask that you will speak to our hearts. Father, you write your word upon our lives by your spirit. Minister to everyone here. Strengthen each one. And Father, we pray that as we go from this place, we will know that God has touched our lives in a special way. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We started last Sunday talking about pictures of the church. The Lord Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the Lord is building his church. And in the series on the pictures of the church, our goal is to get an understanding of what the church ought to be. And we want to journey into that, to be the kind of church that Jesus is building. The New Testament has many pictures or illustrations of the church. And I'll just mention some of these. The church is likened to the body. It's called the body of Christ. The church is called the household of God or the family of God. The church is called the pillar of truth, the upholder of truth. The church is called the temple of God. It's called a house of prayer. It's called Zion, which is the assembly or the gathering of God's people. It's called the bride. The other pictures like the wine and the branches in John 15, the lampstand in Revelation chapter 1, and also the army of God. Because the Lord said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So there are many different pictures of the church. And what we want to do the next three Sundays is pick one each Sunday and just go a little deeper in examining that particular picture and seeing how it relates to us and what our response should be. But there are two key points that we uh, emphasized last Sunday and I want to just reiterate that this morning. The first key point is that church is primarily who we are in relation to him. Without the head, the body is of no use. So no value. So you can have a really strong body. You can have a body that's dressed up in a nice suit. Uh, you could put nice deer on it, make it smell good. Put in a, give it a nice tie, whatever. But if that body doesn't have its head, it's of no use. So church really, first of all, is who we are in relation to him. If we, as individuals and corporately, are not growing in that relationship and that intimacy with Jesus, then our gathering together really is of no value if you're not connected to the head. And the second key point we mentioned is that out of our relation with him, we then relate to one another and we relate to the world. If we relate to one another purely, I mean, aside or apart from our relationship with him, then we're just a club. Now, you've got Bangalore Club, you've got the Turf Club, you've got Cosmopolitan Club, you've got all kinds of clubs. It's just people, a bunch of people relating to one another. What makes us different is that we, out of our relationship with him, we now relate to one another. That's what makes us the church. And also, out of our relation with him, we relate to the world. We do whatever we do in the world. If we are not doing it out of our relation with him, then we're just like another NGO. Lots of good NGOs doing, doing great work. 
They feed the poor, they clothe the naked, they visit prisons, they do all kinds of things. What makes us different? It is out of our relation with him that we reach out and minister and do whatever we are doing. That's what makes us the church. Amen? Two key points. This morning, I want us to look at one of the very interesting pictures of the church, which is that of the bride. The bride. The bride of Christ. In the Lord's dealings with his people in the old covenant, with Israel, and with us in the new covenant, we find some differences, but we also find many similarities. There are many parallels that we could draw in the way God related to the people in the Old Testament and the way he's relating to people in the New. Some differences, for example, is that under the Old Covenant, he related to the people on the basis of the law. And the New Covenant, he relates to us on the basis of grace. In the Old Covenant, not every person had the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. In the New Covenant, every believer has the Holy Spirit living in them. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. So that's the difference. But then there are many similarities between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In both the covenants, God desired to have a people for himself through whom he would bless the world. So the Old Covenant said, you know, come. He told Abraham, come. And then later on, to Moses, he said, you know, I've, I want a people through whom my glory will fill the earth. This is Numbers chapter 11. He wants people through whom the glory, his glory will fill the earth. Same thing in the new. He says, go make disciples of all nations. He wants us to impact nations. Another very interesting similarity between the old and the new is that both in the old and the new testaments, God relates to his people as a groom would relate to his bride. Both covenants. He is the bridegroom God. And his people are his bride. Being prepared for himself. And so what I want us to do this morning is start in the Old Testament, look at several passages of Scripture, look at some in the New Testament, just read them, see what we can get from those verses, and then summarize them so that we understand how we should relate to our bridegroom gods and get ready for our wedding. Amen? Tell your neighbor, man, your wedding's coming. <laughs> Some of that man, I'm never going to get married. No, 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 your wedding's coming. <laughs> but you got to get ready for it. The Old Testament, there are three prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Hosea, who, when speaking to the people, portrayed God as a bridegroom God. Isaiah and Jeremiah prophesied primarily to the tribe of Judah. Hosea prophesied to the, the remaining 11 tribes known collectively as Israel or the tribe of Eph Ephraim, the largest tribe. So they were prophesying to God's people and it was a time when the people of God had actually gone astray, wayward, going after other gods and so on. And so as they were prophesying in order to get them back to their first love, to the God himself, they portrayed God as a bridegroom God reaching out to his bride and wooing his bride back to himself. And it's very interesting to look at these scriptures. So follow along with me, please. We'll start with the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And let's see what we can learn about God as a bridegroom and how we as his bride must relate to him. Jeremiah chapter 2 verses 2 and 3. Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember. Now some of you sitting here, you might remember your engagements. You might remember that wedding day. That's what God is speaking about. 
is saying, I remember, I'm recalling, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal. When you went after me in the wilderness in a land not sown, Israel was holiness to the Lord. The first fruits of his increase, all that devour him will offend. All that devour him will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. So God is saying, listen, I remember the day we got engaged. I remember how kind you were to me. Some husbands would say, man, that's gone. You know? <laughs> that's worn out. <laughs> no. But God's remembering. I remember how kind you were. I remember the love you had. When you went after me, I remember how you were pursuing me. You know, SMS every hour. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> now it's like, if you get one in a week, it's, <laughs> it's joke. <laughs> how you pursued me. Israel was holiness to the Lord. I mean, you are keeping us holy for me. You are the first fruits of my increase. Meaning, you are the best for me. The cream. I, I, you are my first fruits. What I just brought, taken aside for myself. So God is looking back to his people and saying, you have been betrothed to me. And this is what I remember. When you came to me in the wilderness, this was in Mount Sinai, when God established his people unto himself and he was kind of, he said, you know, today I'm engaged with you. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14, return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city, two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. He says, I am married to you. He's using the terms of marriage to say, I'm in this kind of relationship with you. I'm married to you. It's a covenant I will not break. Jeremiah 31 verses 3 and 4. God says, The Lord has appeared of old to me saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore with loving kindness I have drawn you. Again I will build you and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. Why is he calling Israel a virgin? That she's... His bride. You shall again be adorned with your tambourines. And you will go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. So God is assuring us people. Look you've gone away. You've messed up big time. But I want to show you. That I will reach out to you in love. I will draw you with loving kindness and mercy. And I will rebuild you. I will restore you. Because you are my bride. I will adorn you. I'll beautify you. I'll cause you to dance and rejoice once again. Later on in verse 32 of that same chapter, he says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So he's saying, you know, I'm going to establish a new covenant with them. Because when... When I made the first covenant, I was a husband to them, but they were unfaithful. They went away. So he says, I will establish a new covenant. I will give them a new heart. I'll put my spirit in them. I'll write my word in them. So God is saying, I was a husband to them. I was married to these people. The book of Hosea, the entire book has this picture as the background. That of a husband reaching out to an unfaithful wife who's just gone away. God is reaching out to his people. I'll just pick up a few verses from the book of Hosea. Chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer call me my... Meaning, my relationship with you is not going to be that of the law. You know, master, you broke the law. You're going to call me my husband. You will not call me my master. You will call me my husband. It's, going to, it's not going to be one based on being a master. It's going to be based on an intimate relationship as a husband to his own wife. You'll call me my husband. And he continues 
But I will take from her mouth the names of the Baals and they shall be remembered by their name no more. So right now, as Hosea was prophesying, Israel had gone astray. They started following all kinds of other gods and calling the names of other gods. And so God says, you know, when, when I do this and you come back to me as my husband, I will just remove the names of all other gods out of your mouth. You're not going to even mention the names of false gods. You'll no longer be an adulterer. That's spiritual adultery going after false gods. So I'll take that out. In the same chapter in Hosea 2 verses 19 and 20 he says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice, in loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. I want you to see seven things he talks about and that relationship he desires to have with his people for them as, as he is the husband. He is there. Uh, they are his wife, his bride. Seven things. First he says in verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. Number one, it's, a, it's my, you're mine forever. Second he says, I will betroth you to me in righteousness. Meaning this is a holy, it's a sacred, it's a pure relationship. As we come to him in, as his bride, we come to him in righteousness. He draws us to him in purity, in holiness. And then he says, in justice, God executes justice for us. He is our deliverer. He breaks off every oppression and every injustice that comes against his bride. Amen. In loving kindness, in love and kindness, we are recipients of God's love and God's kindness. He draws us in love and kindness. In mercy, mercy overlooks all our faults, all our weaknesses, all our failures, all our wrongdoings. Just come, I'll receive you that way. In faithfulness, his is a faithful love. So I'll be faithful to you. And that's what he wants us to reciprocate to him as his bride. That we too are faithful. And then he says, I call you into intimacy. You shall know the Lord. I want you to come know my heart. Come into the inner chambers of my heart. Come know me. You will know the Lord. This is what God desires of us as his people, as his brides. Isaiah, in Isaiah 54, the, the books of Isaiah, the first 39 books of Isaiah, Isaiah is prophesying warnings and judgments and so on to the people of God. In the next 29 books, he brings hope, he brings healing, he brings restoration, he, he talks about God's goodness and mercy. And in the latter part, in, that, in, those, in those 29 books, of uh, the latter part of Isaiah, you find him talking about God as the husband. Isaiah 54, verses 4 through 6, he's speaking to God's people. He says, do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. Like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. For a, for a mere moment I have forsaken you. But with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness I, have mercy, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. So here he's saying, you know. People, you've gone astray, but listen, I'll remove all the shame. I'll remove all of that. I'll take it off. And I, for I am your husband. And I will rejoice over you as a, as, a, as a youthful wife. I'll bring you back. And he says, I will show you mercies, great mercies, and I will draw you with everlasting kindness. That's how God deals with his people. Isaiah 62, verses 4 through 7. Verse 4, For you shall no longer be town forsaken, 
nor shall your land any more be termed desolate. But you shall be called Hepzibah, and your land Beulah, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. He's talking to his people saying, look, I'm going to do something in you. You're going to be called Hepzibah. That means my delight. You're going to be called Beulah, meaning marriage. And as a groom rejoices over his bride, God will rejoice over you. God rejoices over you and me. As a groom would rejoice over his bride. And he says, I delight in you. I'm married to you. God's people are his delight. God's people are married to him. And he rejoices over his people. Say, so, Pastor, I've been a Christian for 35 years, never heard anything like this. It's in the Bible. He is our bridegroom God, and we are his bride. He's calling us into that kind of a love relationship. In that, kind, in that place of intimacy that is accessible only to those who are married. Amen? And notice the next few verses. This is very important. Isaiah continues in verse 6. I have set watchmen on you, on your walls of Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent and Give him no rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about intercessors. He's talking about people who pray before God for his people. But here's what I want us to notice. That the ministry of intercession is to be birthed out of an understanding that God is the bridegroom God and his people are his brides. And that his people are his delight. His people are married to him. Out of that comes up a people who will stand as watchmen and cry out day and night to God for his people. That he establishes them as a praise, as a beautiful people on the earth. So the ministry of intercession, of prayer, is to be birthed out of this understanding that God's people are his bride. And God delights in his people. And that he is married to them. Amen. So when you understand that. Hey God really, really, really loves his people. And he really cares for them. And then you pray for him, for them. Out of that understanding your prayers are going to be a little different. You're not going to pray. Oh God these people are useless people. God get rid of them quick. No. You're going to say, God, this is your bride. Can you beautify her, God? Can you just draw her with your love? That's how you're going to pray when you understand the bridegroom God and his heart for his people, his bride. Amen? You're going to be a different kind of an intercessor when you understand God's heart as the bridegroom for his people. His brides. And that's how ministry is supposed to be based. As you see in these verses. We now go into the New Testament. I'll just make mention of this in Matthew chapter 9 verses 14 to 17. Some people came to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, we see John's disciples, they fast and pray and uh, the Pharisees fast and pray, but how come your disciples don't fast and pray? And this is just in Matthew 9, chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. And then Jesus says, you know, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn when the bridegroom is with them? No. But when the bridegroom is gone, then they will fast. So here, in his response to this question, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. And we 
his people, his disciples, as friends of the bridegroom. In Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, Matthew 25, 1 to 13, which you and I are familiar with, Jesus uses the Jewish tradition to picture himself as the bridegroom and we waiting to be part of that wedding that's about to happen. So he gives this illustration he, you know, in, the, in the Jewish tradition in those days, weddings usually extend over a period of about seven days, usually happen. The celebration took place in the evenings, in the nights. So when the bridegroom arrived, he would bring, invite his small close of, uh, set of people, close friends, friends of the couple would be invited to the celebration and they would stay on for seven nights of celebration. Be a part of that. So Jesus picks up that illustration from their day and he gives us this parable of the ten virgins. He says that as these ten virgins came and were getting ready to enter the place where the celebrations were about to happen, but they were waiting for the bridegroom to come. And then the door would be opened. Five of them just carried enough oil to last maybe a few hours. Another five came with those lamps, but they also brought extra oil, just in case. And then Jesus says, the bridegroom tarried, he got stuck in traffic. You know, this is modern, modern day. He was trying to make it to St. Mark's Cathedral, wherever, you know. He got stuck in traffic. So these were, they were waiting outside, waiting for the door to be opened. So the bridegroom tarried. He got delayed. So finally at midnight, and then, uh, you know, the bridegroom shows up, but five of them have gone to, gone to sleep. They're not ready. When they hear the sound of the arrival of the bridegroom, they wake up, but their lamps are out, and they don't have oil. They have to go buy the oil. But in that time, the doors are opened. The five who are ready get to get into the wedding celebration. The doors are closed. So five of them are part of that celebration. Five miss out. And then Jesus brings home this point. He says, so in like manner, you need to be ready for the coming of the groom, referring to himself. So we, as his bride, going to be part of that marriage of the lamb, need to be in a state of readiness, in a state of expectancy, but also in a state of endurance. And no matter how long it takes for him to come, we'll be ready. We'll be waiting for him. The Apostle Paul in his writings once again touches on the same husband, wife, bride and groom understanding for his, to, to talk about the ministry and talk about the way Christ relates to the church. In 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul says, for I am jealous for you. He's writing to the Corinthian believers. He says, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So he's saying, people, the people he was ministering to, he says, you know, I, I, I'm jealous for you. I, I'm protective of you. Why? Because I want to, I have actually committed you to be the bride of for Jesus. And I want to present you. As a chaste virgin. For the Lord. What can we learn here? That ministry. Serving God's people. Also has to be done. Out of this understanding. That they are his bride. And we are actually serving people. To get them ready as his bride. For him. Amen. Ministry has to be done out of that understanding. Not as, oh, no, these are bad people. And I need to straighten them out. No, 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 no. They are his bride. He loves them with an everlasting love. He draws them back with loving kindness. He will rebuild them. He will restore them. He, that's his heart. That's the heart of the bridegroom God. But we are his ministers as we serve. We serve in this manner. We are preparing a bride. He bears this out again in Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 22 to 32, as he talks about the relationship of a husband to his, to his wife, he says, you know, this is how Christ relates to the church. And I'll just highlight 
of that portion of the scripture where Christ is relating to the church. Here's what he mentions in that passage. He says, Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the savior of the body. The church is subject to Christ. Christ loved the church so much so that he gave himself for her. Christ sanctifies and cleanses her by his word. That's why the ministry of the word is so important. Because as you're ministering the word, you're doing what Jesus desires, to cleanse and sanctify his bride. He will present her to himself as a glorious church. The church is progressing in its glory. Because he is going to bring it to a place where it's a glorious church. Before he presents it to himself. So don't be too quick to say the church is getting bad. No. It's becoming a glorious church. Amen. That's what he's doing. He's making it a glorious church. She should be holy and without blemish. He's bringing us to a place of purity. Holiness. No blemish. Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. He nourishes it. He's feeding into the church everything he wants. And he cherishes the church. Do you know that he cherishes the church? He's excited about his people. It's like the Old Testament. He calls them Hepzibah, my delights. He cherishes the church. This is the relationship that Jesus has as the bridegroom towards his bride, the church. John, in the 19th chapter, gets a vision. He's taken way ahead into time. And he writes in the 19th chapter of Revelation about the marriage of the Lamb. Verses 6 through 9, he says, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude Multitude as the sound of many waters as the sound of, a, of mighty thundering saying hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me right. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So it seems like right through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, God has been preparing a bride for this great marriage supper that's going to take place. This bride consists of people who've been made righteous in the blood of the Lamb. They've been gar given garments of righteousness. And there are people who walk out this righteousness, righteous acts. They are the ones who get to sit at that table. To be married to the bridegroom God. That's what God's preparing us for. To be united with him as his bride. So we can call him my husband. May look to him in that, that kind of a relationship. One of closeness, one of intimacy, one that's overwhelmed by love. Close with this last verse of scripture. In Revelation 22 and verse 17, John writes, And the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride say, come. We're calling out, come, Lord Jesus. Waiting for the groom. Come. But notice it says, the spirit and the bride. Telling us that the Holy Spirit is here to prepare us as a bride. Be not on our own. Amen. Thank God he didn't leave the hands of the church to the pastors, you know. He left the church in the hands of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is working on the church. 
And the spirit moves the church. The spirit and the bride say, come. Come, Jesus. For a church that is glorious. For a church that is without spot or wrinkle. But now the Holy Spirit's working on the church. Come on, church. You've got to get ready. Come on, church. Come on. Come on. Get your wedding gown on. Come on, wash your face. Get all the dirt off, you know. Come on, church. The Spirit is getting the church ready. So that the spirit and the bride can say, come, come, we welcome you. Jesus, the bridegroom, God, we welcome you. But also tells us, emphasizes for us the importance that we as the bride must be in so alignment and unison with the spirit of God. Hearing and saying and doing what he desires. It's important for us as his people to be just flowing with the spirit. Because the Spirit is going to get us ready for the bridegroom's coming. Amen. I want to just summarize all that we've read in all these passages with seven insights here on uh, our relationship as a bride with the groom. We mentioned some of these last Sunday. We'll just repeat them here this morning. Number one, the bride is lost in her love, admiration, and commitment to her groom. That's the kind of people we are supposed to be. Amen? Thank you for one amen. <laughs> it's like, man, did I get through to the others, you know? We are his brides. We're supposed to be lost in love. Admiration, commitment to the groom, the bridegroom, God. And you know, this is worship. It's simply love songs that the bride sings to the groom songs that describe how great and how majestic and how wonderful the groom is to the bride. We sing the love songs of God's own heart back to himself, inspired by his spirit. That's worship. So when you worship, think about yourself as a bride, just, just adoring the groom. How lovely you are, God. And this is what God desires. No, Jeremiah 2, 2 and 3 says, hey, I remember how kind you were. How loving you were. How you came after me. How you were my holy unto me. You were my first fruit. You were my best. So I remember that. See, that's the desire of God's heart. Secondly, all right, let me just make a side comment here. You know, as we're talking about the bride and the groom and so on, two things. Tap your neighbor and say, at least listen to this. <laughs> Number one, ladies, don't interpret this truth in a very fleshly way of romancing Jesus as your lover, boyfriend, or husband. <laughs> That's a very fleshly interpretation of it. Please don't do that. And for us men, as you talk about being the bride, don't get scared that you'll lose your manhood or your masculinity, you know. That now you have to start behaving feminine because you're the bride. No, 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 no. Understand, this is a a, a spiritual relationship. And so its application is for our spiritual, the way we relate to Jesus spiritually. You're still a man. Amen? And I just had to make it clear that others, you know, suddenly you have men behaving like women. So what, Pastor, you told us we're the bride, you know. <laughs> Relax. Number two, the bride adorns herself in what would, be, what would please her groom. So that she can present herself in her best for the groom. We talked about this last Sunday. You know, a, a, a bride, yes, you want to look good and all of that. But you will definitely take into account, I want to look good in his eyes. I want to smell good for him. So I want to wear what will please him, the groom. Now, if the groom likes salwar kameez and you come there in tight jeans, man. Oh. You might like it, but maybe he doesn't. Or if the groom likes a certain smell and you just 
you know, bathed yourself in the wrong kind of smell. You come in and the moment you approach me, get a headache. You mess the whole thing up. So it's not about what you like. It's about what he likes. And so also for us as the church, we must remember the church is not about us and not, what, not about what pleases us. It's about what pleases Jesus. So when we come together on Sunday mornings, it's not about us. Jesus, what pleases you? That's what we want. It's not about us impressing one another. It's about us pleasing him. Because we could look great in each other's eyes, but he says, man, I can't even stand your side of you guys. No, that's, we missed the whole point. So it's not about how good we look before each other. It's about how we please him. He is the groom. We are his bride. Number three. The bride is a recipient of the groom's unconditional love. You find it repeated in all these passages over and over again. How much he loves. No matter how much the, the bride's messed up, he says, I will rebuild you. I will restore you. I will take away your shame. And I will love you with loving kindness. And I will give you mercy. That's his heart. And we are recipients of this kind of love from God. You know, we must give ourselves to this truth and say, okay, I'm going to embrace this. I'm going to accept his heart of unconditional love for me. Number four, the bride has access to the groom's heart, a place of intimacy. Now, you, you find two people during their courtship time, they got engaged during the time of courtship, you know, that they want to they just share everything. They want to open up their heart. And that's how it is with God. He wants his bride to come in to know him, as we saw earlier. Jeremiah 2. Come to know my heart. So, he longs for this. Sorry, this was Hosea 2.20. He longs for this. For us to come into a place of intimacy. Come there. Come into the inner chambers of my heart. Is what the bridegroom God calls out to his bride. And we must respond. Number five. The bride keeps herself with the groom. She does not settle for any other man. So Jesus is coming back for a church that is without spot and blemish. That is holy. That is pure. For a bride that has kept herself as a chaste virgin. For her groom. It's coming back for that. And this also brings to us the understanding that, you know, holiness and purity is, is, is birthed out of this understanding. When you understand how much he loves you, that he actually cherishes you, then you say, okay, I'll give myself back fully to him. I will not waste my time with sin and things that uh, bring blemish on me. No. He loves me so much. I'm going to reciprocate that by giving myself fully to him. Number six, we are called to be like a bride getting ready for her marriage to the groom. She waits with expectation. She's enduring. Okay, might be a little delayed, but I'm waiting. I'm not giving up. We wait that way. We're looking forward to it. Number seven. When we serve the body of Christ, we are serving the bride of Christ. A people whom God loves unconditionally. A people in whom he delights as his brides. A people whom he is married to. So all ministry must flow out of this understanding. Amen. I'm serving a people that he delights in. I don't need to bang them on the head and say, you useless people, go home. You know, no. no. It's his bride. He delights in his people. He draws them with loving kindness to himself. All ministry must be birthed out of this understanding. We are preparing a bride. 
of that great bridegroom God. Amen? Let's take some time right now before we dismiss to let this truth sink into our hearts. To know that God loves us so deeply. And He desires to engage with us in such an intimate manner that even our minds cannot comprehend at times. But He wants to bring us into that place where we will know Him, that place of intimacy, that place of closeness with Him. And out of that, we do everything we do. When we relate to one another, when we relate to this world, we relate out of that understanding that we are a people who are His delight. We are a people who are married to the Lord.
you respond this morning to his love for you? His unconditional love. No matter what we've done, he says, I will love you. Would you respond to that? And say, God, because you love me so much, I'm turning to you, God. I'm turning away from sin and I'm turning away from my wrongdoing. Because where else can I find this kind of love? Where else can I find this faithful love? I'm turning to you. I'm coming to you. Would there be even one person this morning who says, Lord, I'm turning to you, God. Thank you for this love, this unconditional love. This faithful love. Thank you for that. And I just reach out to you and say yes to your love of God this morning. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from my wrong. I come to you. I want to love you in return. I want to reciprocate this love that you have. Even though my love may be so small compared to what you offer to me, but I want to give you my best. I want to love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. So, Father, this morning, would you draw people to your own self, for oh God? The love that breaks of all chains, the love that sets free, the love that delivers us from all forms of oppression and bondage. Do this in our midst, Lord. Do this in our midst. Touch people. We thank you, Father, for doing this. Thank you. In Jesus' name. If you've never prayed and opened your heart to Jesus and welcomed him into your life, would you just pray a simple prayer and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive my sins. And make me a child of God. I want to follow you for the rest of my life. If you've never prayed a prayer like that, I want to encourage you to do that right now. Give your heart to Jesus, your life to Him. Thank you, Lord. Let's close. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. Lift up His countenance on you. Surround you with His favor and give you His peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.